Is it recording? I think so. Okay. Yeah. So, welcome to session two. Um, yeah, so last week, we pretty much just set up a spree, put in our stock, our part, um, create some chains. Um, today, we're not going to be doing much in a spree, but really just talking about different tools, your options, what those tools can do, and feeds and speeds. So we can just get started. Um, so your most basic tool, your end mill, it does a majority of the cutting for mills. Um, and they all have like different um, qualities. So end mills, they have these flutes, which are essentially these cutting edges. Um, so on this end mill, there, there are four, four flutes. Um, so there's pretty much like four blades that are cutting the stock at once. And so that's one of the main qualities of a end mill. Um, you also have certain diameter. Um, some end mills are ferrous and some are non-ferrous. Um, ferrous end mills include iron and you use them for like cu cutting tougher materials as like steel or inconel. Um, but for our applications, we're usually using this aluminum 661. So we could just get away with using non-ferrous end mills and they cut great. Um, and regular end mills, their cutting face is flat, while ball end mills, like the one seen over here, is has a curved edge, um, curved bolt face. You would use this type of end mill um, for parts that has a lot more curves and uh, rounded edges, but we haven't had the need to use ball end mills on, or at least for our rocket. Um, so we'll just stick with regular end mills. Um, and they can be used for pocketing, contouring, and facing, for the most part. Um, our next tool is the face mill. Um, pretty much self-explanatory. It removes a lot of material very fast, and it's very good at creating flat surfaces. So pretty much always want to start with a face mill if you want to make a surface um, perpendicular. Uh, and then for holes, you would typically use a combination of these three uh, tools. So the first one is the chamfer drill, um, or called the chamfer, or, or the spot drill or center drill. Essentially just creates a little, like a divot in the stock, which you can use to guide a drill into your stock. Um, so essentially, if you were to drill a hole using a drill straight into a flat surface, it is likely to deflect um, if you don't approach it at a perfect 90 degree angle. So using a center drill really helps guide that drill down so it will be perfectly perpendicular. And you could also use it to chamfer edges. Um, so that's its main purpose, to create a spot and chamfer edges. And then drills, um, I'm sure you guys all know, they just create holes. And they have usually have three classifications. Um, machine, jober, and taper, and those just indicate how long each drill is. They all do the same thing, but for certain applications, let's say your, your hole is much like maybe more than like two inches thick, you may want to consider using a jober or a taper because the machine drill are typically just shorter, uh, but they all do the same thing. And then tap, or the tap is used to create inner threads. Um, yeah, so that those are tools you use to make holes. And then there are two different types of taps. You have your cut tap and your form tap, and those are two pictures of each. You can tell that um, your cut tap has these little slots in them, and they're called flutes also. Uh, the difference is that cut taps actually cut the, the stock, so it, it removes um, the material, while form taps don't remove any material. They kind of just mesh the material around itself. Um, so that's why the form tab doesn't need any flutes because none of the metal is actually coming off of the stock. Um, and they both make threads just in different fashion. And you'll soon see how uh, it's important to know which tap you're using because the numbers that you put into a spree will be different. And Washburn uh, is pretty much switched to only form taps because it seems like they break less than the cut taps. Um, so now we're going to get into a spree. Um, I can just 
haven't opened it up yet. Yeah, go ahead and open up a spree now. Um, and just you can just use the same file you had from last week. Um, actually, I would recommend that because we are going to add tools. Um, yeah, so just go to file, open, whatever file you were using last week. So um, this is what we had from last week. If we look at this area, I forgot what it's called. Uh, project manager. Oh yeah, that's what it's called, the project manager. The first tab over here is the features tab. And then the second one is the tool tab. So today we're just gonna be looking at the tool tab. So if you click on the second tab, um, which indicate over here, you will see the tools that we have. So right now we have six. And those are the tools that have been loaded previously from the template. Um, but you sometimes you're going to need tools that aren't included here. And we can add or remove tools in this tab. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. So we want to uh, add in a tool. You can just right click anywhere inside of this area. Go to new, milling tools, since we're doing mill. And then you can select the tool that you want. So the the main ones that you're probably going to have to add are like end mills, which have different diameter sizes, um, drills, and taps. Your face mill is pretty standard, so I would suggest using the template every time you make a new cam file because it automatically includes the face mill and the center mill, um, which are pretty much used always. And then a lot of the end mills that they have in the shop are already included, so you usually won't have to add new end mills just your drill sizes and sometimes end mills, but mostly just different drills and taps is what you're gonna have to look, uh, try to add into your spree files. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different other tools, but for the most part, we're gonna stick with the top half. Okay, so when we add tools, there's this procedure that you always wanna follow. Um, always wanna change the tool ID to whatever the name of the tool is. So let's say you, you're adding like a quarter inch drill. You just want to type, uh, type that in, just quarter inch drill. And then your tool number and your length composition uh, register should both be the same. So if you look over here, each tool is numbered. And then you just, if you're adding the tool, you just assign it to the number that's after the largest one. So the largest tool is six. So the next one just be seven eight, and then you just keep going until you finish all your tools. Um, and that would be in the first tab over here. So I can just demonstrate. So let's say we want to add like a drill. We could do that. Um, yeah, you're just putting your drill, just like quarter inch drill. Um, your tool number and your letter comp register would pretty much automatically be there if you add a new tool. Then in your second tab, just for settings, you, you want to change turret name to head. I'm not sure what that does, but if you don't do that, uh, it'll give you some problems. So yeah, that is the, pretty much uh, the fundamentals for adding any tool. So you always want to do a tool ID, tool number, letter comp, register, and then in settings, change the turret name to head. Yeah, so I'm going to go over the different uh, numbers that you're going to have to put into a spree so it would know what type of tool you're using. So for end mill, this is the, pretty much a diagram um, right here with where it has the tool diameter, shank diameter, uh, tool length, and cutting length. So like I talked before, the flutes is number of cutting edges. So that's the first thing you want to know are using a four flute, end mill, three flute, two flute. Um, in the shop, they usually have three or four, um, but it's good to know which one you're using beforehand because that will affect the way your tool pass will come out. And then um, tool length is a little bit misleading because you would typically think you would just measure how long the tool is, but that's not the case. It's actually how far the tip of the tool is, is to the top. Oh, well, 
pretty much whatever is sticking out. So your tool will actually go into like this area because it needs to be gripped on by the tool holder. Um, so tool length will actually be less than the entire tool length. So if you set your tool length to be three and your simulations go well, that means you can you just need at least three inches um, to stick out of the of the tool holder and possibly less. But if you set it to three, you'll you'll know that it won't break the tool. Um, so yeah, these are the five things you'll need. And typically your tool diameters is gonna be the same thing as your shank diameter if you use this type of end mill. But for taper end mills like this one, the shank diameter is typically bigger than the, the cutting or tool diameter. Um, but it's not too much of a big deal. I think the most important part is just the tool diameter because that is what it's cutting with. Yeah. Um, so that is the five things you need to know when inputting an end mill. And then for drills, it's pretty much the same thing, except for drills, there's a, a corner at the tip, but the actual angle, it will ask for it, but it's really not too important. Um, so you can just leave it as whatever it is. And it doesn't really have fluids, so I don't really know. I don't know what it's why it's asking for it. It will ask your number of flutes, but usually bad, whatever the default is. And then lastly are your taps. Um, just a quick review on tap notation. So for imperial taps, like your standard A32 or quarter 20, stuff like that, it's always the first number is always going to be the diameter, and then the second number is your thread per inch, and then if you're referring to a bolt, the third diameter will be the length of the bolt. But for taps, it's only going to have two numbers: the first diameter, then your thread per inch. Um, and then for metric taps, the first number is your diameter, and then your second number is your pitch. So your pitch is just the distance between two consecutive um, two consecutive threads, and then your thread per inch. It's just one over your pitch. So how many threads there are in a span of one inch? So, yeah. Okay. So that is how you identify your, your taps. And then it's important that you know what the pitch is or your thread per inch. Um, and in, in the case of metric, it's either pitch or thread per millimeter. Because when you're inputting the tap in a spree, it will ask you for either your pitch or your thread per unit. So if you know one of them, you just put it in and it'll figure out what the second one is. Um, so like, let's say you want to put in a 32, you automatically know your thread per inch is 32. So you can just put in for a thread per unit, you just type in 32 and it'll calculate your pitch for you. And then your tool diameter would just be whatever a number eight would be and the rest you just fill out. Um, number flutes, also not important. And taper angle is, it believe for tabs that have tapers, but it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so that's that's for tabs. And then here we're gonna talk about speeds and feeds. Um, so speeds and feeds are pretty much your their values that are assigned to different tools that have been documented. So this is like not really something you can calculate because if like manufacturers have just tested out their tools and they know what the correct speeds and feeds are. Um, so speed is, just think of it as your angular velocity, just how fast your tool is spinning. And it can be measured in um, first surface feet per minute or RPM. Um, and here's the equation that relates both of them. Um, surface feet is pretty much, you can think of it as your um, tangential velocity, um, radial velocity, essentially. Just how fast your the tip of your tool is, and then convert it from your distance to feet and then your time to minute. And then your feet is how fast it moves in this, how fast it translates in your x and y and z direction. And that is 
the main unit for feed is inch per minute, and then it can be converted into feet per, feed per tooth and then feed per rotation, which are used for different tools. So you would use feed per tooth for animals and face mounts because it's important to know like how much load each tooth is holding. So if you have an end mill with more teeth, it's able to move faster because it cuts at a faster rate since it has more flutes. Um, and then same for drills. It's very much dependent on how much, how big the diameter is. Uh, so yeah, those are your feeds and uh, speeds and feeds. And then lastly is your depth of cut, which is pretty much how much material is cutting in one pass. So there are two depth of cuts, your radial and axial depth of cut. Radially is how much material is um, is it passing radially? I guess um, if you look at the diagram, this is what it looks like when an end mill is slotting. So 100% of its diameter is being utilized to cut the stock. While something like here, less of its diameter. So this would be around 50% of its diameter is being using to cut. And then as you probably realize, depth of the cut is sometimes referred to a percentage of diameter or sometimes just actually just like how many inches is being used. Um, and if you can keep your radial depth of cut under 30, you could relieve a lot of stress. And it's just a safe number to stay under um, because once you start like increasing your depth, radial depth of cut, as well as your active depth of cut, you just increase the risk of breaking your tools. Um, however, for slotting, it's slotting is very much non-ideal, but sometimes you're gonna have to do it. And there are other ways, there are ways to prevent you to break your end mill when you're slotting, even though using 100% of your diameter to cut is very bad. Um, and then there is your axial, pretty much how deep uh, each cut is. So I, I, I hope these diagrams are, do a good job showing you um, how much it cuts. And then a good uh, rule of thumb is keep your depth of cut around one diameter. But of course, all these suggestions are meant to be thrown away. Um, they're all just good ways to start. But once you have more experience, you know like the, the limits of each tool. So you can get to a point where you're running at like 80% uh, radio depth of cut. And if you know the tool can handle it, then you, it's fine. And yeah, so these are your four process variables and like they're typically the things that you change and it will directly affect how your part comes out. Um, all these process variables, if you increase your speed, feed, radio depth of cut or axial depth of cut, you are directly increasing your cutting force which you're pretty much putting a lot, increasing the stress um, that you're putting onto the tool. But in return, you're lowering your runtime because your volumetric removal rate is increasing. So in a sense, you're increasing the efficiency of your tool paths so because you're, finish, you're finishing more parts in the same amount of time, but you're possibly breaking more tools. So as a machinist, you kind of have to try to find the balance where you would finish a part in less time, but also not break a lot of tools or ideally any tools. Um, so those are the four things that have been documented. And so let's say you're trying to find out these process variables for an end mill. It can all be ignored if you do think that you can cut in a better way. Um, but as a beginner, I think it's good to just follow what the documents say because those have been tested a lot and you know they won't break if you set it up right. And lastly, you have your material classes, um, which will directly affect what your speed feeds of end up to cut are gonna be because tougher materials will indicate how you're gonna cut that. Um, and for our purposes, we're just gonna be sticking with N2 and that is, what we're going to be using for our 6061 aluminum. Then to find our speeds and feeds as well as depth cut, you can 
go to the MFE Labs website. Um, this wpi.mfelabs.org. Um, this is the Washburn Labs website. If you go to Information for Students and then scroll down to Feeds and Speeds, you can find all the documentation, at least a lot of it, for the tools they have in the shop. Um, so yeah, for Edmills, um, we're just gonna wanna set the speed, which is pretty much the RPM or how much, how fast the spindle is spinning to the max RPM that that machine is assigned to, mainly because our, the max RPM that our machines can handle are significantly lower than the recommended speed. Um, so yeah, for end mills, they're top, typically around 50,000 RPM, but our machines can't handle that. So we're just gonna try to get as close as we can. And so, so yeah, these are the three machines that we have, mini mill, VM2, and super mini mill. And these are the speeds you're just gonna wanna set for pretty much all of your end mills because even at this speed, it's running suboptimally. Uh, but there's nothing we can do about it since it's capped out at that speed. But your feeds, if you go to non-ferrous end mills, which we'll be using for our 6061 aluminum, you click on it, it'll open up a spreadsheet and then you match the tool, the type of tool you're using. So let's say we're using a half inch end mill, then we're gonna refer to this row. Um, if you look, there is your incremental depth of cut and your step over. Your incremental depth of cut is, is the same thing as your axial depth of cut. So if you look at this diagram, they refer it to as AP, and that is how deep your cut is axially. And then your step over is your radial depth of cut, also referred to as AE. So if you see AP and AE, you can just refer to this uh, picture. And then over here, you can see that every single tool, the speed uh, is set to 6,000. Um, this is just because they have it set to 6,000, so the M1800 kids know to set it as, at the max RPM of the mini mill. Otherwise, you just want to set it to the max RPM of whatever machine you're using. And then over here, your last two columns, your XY feed per tooth and then Z feed per tooth. So this is just your 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 feed. Um, it's important that you know when you input the the tool into the spree, you actually know how many flutes it has because the number of flutes will indicate how what the feed is going to be because this is a feed per tooth. So the more tooth you have, the greater your feed is going to be. Um, and then that's just gonna, it's going to be the same for the X Y feed and the Z feed. So those are pretty much the five things you need to know for any end mill. Uh, axial depth of cut, radial depth of cut, speed, and your two feeds. Okay. So that is your speeds and feeds and depth of cut for end mills. For face mills, it's a lot more self-explanatory because our shop only uses pretty much three inch face mills. But you, you can find the same thing on the website if you go to on the bottom, face mills. And they only have documentation for N classes, which is fine because if, as long as we stick with the aluminum, we won't have too much problems. Um, so yeah, it's, so you look at the unit, it says surface feet per minute. Um, it kind of has recommendations for your minimum max, but start using the starting value of 42.52 is pretty decent, but you can always just crank it up to 6,000, um, it's not a big deal. And then your feed per tooth is just, I, I typically just keep it with three thousandths of an inch. And that's, that's worked pretty well, um, yeah. Then your, this is, oh, sorry. So this is for the drill mill, which is also called the chamfer mill. And I mean, public explanatory, it's all the same for, these three, so end mills, drill mills, and face mills, they kind of all work the same way, where they all have their depth of cut, uh, speeds, and feeds. So all three, uh, same idea. But then once we get into drills, it gets a little different. Um, your speed is going to be the same. Um, it's it depends on the type of material your drill is and the material you're cutting it. 
So if you look at here, here is this, these four columns are your speeds. And typically we just use uncoded drills. So if you go to whatever, typically this one, aluminum cast less than 10% silicon, that's a good one to use, 225 for the drills that we use in the shop. And then you can look at uh, your tool diameter and then you'll find your Z feed per revolution. Um, well, let's say your tool isn't there, like you have maybe like a three quarter inch drill, which is really big. You can just use these numbers, create like a linear regression, or you can just make a good estimate and you'll be able to find your Z feed. And for taps, you, it's, uh, taps are tougher to find because there's so many different manufacturers and your speed is very much dependent on what the manufacturer uh, requests. Well, not requests, like what they recommend. So if you like, let's say you buy your buy a tap from a website, they will always come with documentation for a recommended speed. Um, but this chart is typically very good with whatever tap you're using. And then for your Z feed, you always want it to be, you want to set your Z feed equal to your pitch. So pretty much one over your third branch. Um, which if you think about it, it makes sense because you want the threads, you want to make one thread after one rotation. Otherwise you would break the tap. Um, so if you want to do some practice, what, uh, what Z feed would you use for a A32? And then what would you use for a M11-1.75? You can just shout it out to, you know. For the A32, would it be one over eight for your Z feed? Uh, not quite. So you're doing one over your thread for inch, right? So which one of these numbers is your? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's inch. 32. So one over 32. Yeah, so yeah, your Z feed for your A32 would be one over 32. And what about your M11 1.75? What, what would your Z feed be for that one? Um, so if you remember from the previous slide, for metric taps, the first number is diameter, and the second number is pitch. So if you're given an, a metric tap, your Z feet is just whatever the second number is because it's just pitch. And the units would just be millimeters per revolution, while for imperial taps is just inch per revolution. So yeah, that is how you find your speed and feeds for your taps. And then um, we have tap drills. So the procedure when creating a tap, you always want to start with a spot drill to uh, lead in your your drill, then you're gonna do the drill, and after the drill, you have a hole which you can use a tap for to create your threads. Um, the thing is that for every tap, there is a designated tap drill, um, and your tap drill depends on pretty much your, the diameter of your tap and if it's a cut versus a form tap. So this is something also you're gonna have to search up. And I mean, it's kind of, it's pretty much, it is well documented, I think. Um, so this is something just like, let's say you wanna use an 832 to cut tap, then you can just search it up what the drill tap is. And then and since we typically use quarter 20s and 832s, I've put down the tap drills that you'll typically use. Um, and since we only, we pretty much only use form taps, you would just use a number one tap drill for a quarter 20 and then a number 25 tap drill for a number eight. Yeah. And you, you, you'll see that the form tap drill is slightly bigger than your cut tap drills because for form taps, um, you're not cutting anything, you're just mushing the material around it. So it helps to have a bigger diameter already in the start. In the start. Otherwise you may put a lot of extra stress on your tap 
which it does not like. So, um, if you don't know, uh, people typically have a lot of issues with breaking taps, and that's most of the time because um, their program is just bad. To avoid that, you just want to make sure all your numbers are correct. So always check your speeds, your feeds. Make sure you always uh, use the right tap drill. So let's say you're using a, a form tab, but then you use the cut tap drill. You might end up drilling a hole that's too small for your tap. And then you put too much stress on your tap, and then it breaks. So uh, yeah, just always make sure that your tap drill is correct. Because I think that is maybe one of I think the leading causes of leading taps is if your Z feed is incorrect, if you miscalculate it, or if your tap drill size is incorrect. Um, otherwise, if you follow this procedure, you should never have a problem with taps breaking. Okay, so um, if we're going to be looking back at the part from last week. Um, so we already have all the end mills that we could all we could possibly want to use. We also have the face mill and our chamfer mill, but we don't have any taps or drills. So we're going to try to figure out which um, which tools we need for that. So if you can look, if you want to look at this drawing, um, I pretty much indicated all the different tools that they're in. The holes that they're that are in this part, and if you look at this top view, it'll indicate um, the drill, the hole specifications. Um, so yeah, these are the three tools we're going to use. So if you look, there's seven taps um, on the left side, and they're all quarter twenty. So of course you're going to need a quarter twenty tap, and we're going to use a form tap because that's what the shop has. And going along with that tap, we're going to need the tap drill. And for Tor Quarter 24 taps, that happens to be a number one drill. So these two work hand in hand. They work together hand in hand. Um, yeah, so whenever, whenever there is a Quarter 24 tap, you always want to accompany it with a number one drill. And then this drill uh, or hole, which happens to be a counterbore, a diameter of 0.266, which is the equivalent of an H drill. So we'll use that, that drill for this hole over here. Yeah. And then it's also important to know um, what tool length you're going to need because if you look at uh, the tap, like right here, you'll see that it's, it goes an inch down. So um, Don't know what this is definitely wrong, but uh, just ignore this. But you want to know, you want to make sure that you have enough tool, part of the tool sticking out of the spindle, so that it would be able to clear that hole completely. Otherwise, if your um, if your drill is too short, you might crash this the uh, tool holder into the part, which is never good. Uh, so yeah, always look at the CAD and make sure that your your tool is going to be long enough to go all the way down. Then um, we're gonna go back to the spree. And something, a cool trick that you can do is um, you can save tools that you currently have. Like let's say you wanna save your, a few end modes, you can just select all of them. Then you go right click and then go to file and, oh, sorry. And you can save them. And let's say you, like this is, Pretty much very important if you have a part with multiple ops where you want to keep loading in the same tools and not have to put them into a spree every time. So like I have a ton of tool files already saved from previous programs. So like let's say like uh, tools for palette, I can just open it up and then it could it'll put in tools even if they're already in there. So it'll tell you if you want to replace them or not. Otherwise, it'll, it'll add all the new tools that are not in there. Um, so that is something very useful if you want to keep repeating the same tools in different files. Yeah, that is, so 
that's pretty much what I had for my presentation. But if you, what I suggest you guys try to do is insert these three tools into a spree. First of all, do you guys have any questions about what, I, what I've said today? My computer crashed when I tried to open my VPN, and I didn't see how you um, added a tool. So could you just do that? Yeah. Once more? OK. Um, so there's you go into the tools menu, then you'll see all the tools you have. And if you right click into an empty slot, you can go to new, then mailing tools, and then you pick the tool that you want. So let's say you want to add like a drill. Um, so we have, let's say we want to add a number one drill. Um, so we'll just change the tool ID to number one drill. Tool number and letter comp register will just be set to seven. Go to the settings tab. Change the turret name to head and go to your cutter tab. Um, the tool diameter is going to be 0.228. Yep. And it's automatically going to set your shank diameter to the same thing as your tool diameter, which happens to be the case almost every time. Then your cutting length is, well, that's something you're going to need a tool for. But if you want to know ahead of time, you can find that info on MFU Labs. So if you go to the Speeds and Feed website and then go to Dimensions and then English, it has the tool length and the flute length for machine, jober, and taper uh, uh, drills. So if you want to know ahead of time of like what type of drills they have and their specifications, then you can just go in here. All right. But also, like, hey. like I said, yep, yeah, of course. Um, and what I said, like like I said before, um, your tool lengths are a little bit misleading because here it will give you your overall length of your screw, but of course less of, less than that is going to be poking out because a little bit of the of the drill is going to be like secured into the tool holder. So just know that your total length is going to be less than whatever this value is. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, we can just go back and then it's not a big deal what you're cutting length. If you see that after you create a tool path that you've crashed the, the tool, then you can go back in here and adjust your tool length and your cutting length. Otherwise, what you have here is it's pretty much fine. Then your tool is now in the screen. Do we have any other questions? I have some slides ready um, for like facing and like contouring. I think I'm gonna like leave that for next week. I'm good, but thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, we don't have any questions. I'm just gonna stop the recording for today.